I'm going to start the recording and um, thanks everyone for tuning in for this um, conversation about community gardens in our community. Um, we are joined by several community gardeners as well as Julie Lehman, the coordinator of the garden project. Happy to just highlight a couple, uh, two um, of the community gardens of, of probably more than a dozen in the community. Um, 10 are directly involved with uh, Greater Lansing Food Bank's garden project. Um, so we'll be hearing from um, Wardcliffe and Briarwood Community Garden. Um, but Meridian Township has a really long standing tradition of support for uh, the community gardens, which we are just so thankful for. Um, we've seen that certainly um, manifest itself in terms of financial support consistency through the years, um, but also just a spirit like today's meeting of, of wanting to push forward both community-based projects and projects that are moving forward, good food um, and environmental stewardship. And that's really what we are seeing at these community gardens. So um, if there are any immediate questions, I could I'd be happy to answer that. Otherwise, I think we have um, Esther speaking of uh, Briar, uh, Wardcliffe Garden first. Uh, so I will hand it over to Esther. I think you might need to unmute yourself, um, Esther. Is that okay now? All right, good. I am um, a real dinosaur when it comes to technology. Um, a little bit about Wardcliffe. You know, I can't believe how many years have passed. We began in 2010 and it went something like this. Wardcliffe School closed and we saw all this land and we weren't sure what was going to happen. Um, and so I thought, well, how about a community garden? I am not really a gardener, but I like concepts like that. So um, I went to the superintendent and I said, uh, you know, how about um, we start a community garden? And she says, well, that's a great idea. You have liability insurance? And I <laughs> said, well, I'll be back. <laughs> At that time, um, I knew Sharon Krynock, who was head of um, the food bank. And I said, Sharon, do you have gardens? And do they have insurance? She goes, yeah, could we be one of your gardens? And that's how we began. Because with the liability insurance and the fact that they wouldn't give us water from the building because the building was closed, I said, uh, you know, the neighborhood will... Um, weed and make sure that the school doesn't look like a closed school. You will mow, but the uh, parking lot, weeds will grow. We'll make sure that that doesn't happen in exchange would you give us water. And so with water and land in place, we began. And it's um, 2010 and we um, doubled in size uh, from the first, um, I, not knowing um, much about the environment and the deer that come into the yard at night. Um, I left for Hawaii and Marty Chilvers, he is my guardian angel. He knows about gardening and I got this email the first week in Hawaii, the deer are coming and eating stuff from the garden. So he whipped up a, a, you know, a very flimsy fence. Um, but he took care of it and he's been taking care of the fundamentals of good gardening and good soil. Um, and we're so thankful for um, the compost we received over the years. It was clay when we started. And, um, and then the, the garden project helped us put up this amazing deer fence. And um, we have had amazing produce this year to share with the people, the neighborhood, they all come and watch our garden grow. I mean, people walk by and uh, they get kale or chard or whatever is um, in season. And uh, we have really enjoyed the process of bringing not only the neighborhood, but people have heard about the garden. And so when we have extra plots, we invite other people to garden. And there's a number of um I, I guess diverse groups, you know, people from Africa, uh, people who like 
their native vegetables that they can't get at the market. Um, so we have some interesting things. And this year we had a potluck at the garden, which we got to meet the people. And we have projects like we planted um, four trees this year alongside the garden. Um, two, uh, three different kinds of pears one and one apple and, I'm sorry, two different kinds of pears, one apple and um, a service berry. So um, that was a real accomplishment. So we hope that it will thrive. So wonderful, Esther. And we'll have a time for Q&A with these garden leaders after we hear from Briarwood, but I just wanna speak kudos to Esther. I've been in my position for 10 years, um, which sometimes feels like a long time. And sometimes when you're in the world of gardening and you just have one shot at doing something each year and you think, well, I've only tried that 10 times in my entire <laughs> time here, um, time can go by really quick. Um, but there are certain people that just are an encouragement and they have both the um, longevity and the heart. And Esther is one of those people for me, even though we don't interact that often when I do, I get to hear that spirit from her both the spirit and the kindness of what's drawn her to the garden and just her longevity of um, just seeing a project through and the many different ups and downs of just saying, we'll find a way together. So I just always love hearing from you, Esther. Um, a newer garden in our network, which we love the existing gardens and we love the new gardens. So I want to highlight Briarwoods next and I'll hand it over to Mark. That's wonderful. We're seeing your screen, Mark, and then you can unmute and hear from me. Sorry about that. Thanks. I uh, Once I shared, my mute button disappeared. I haven't used Zoom in a while. Um, yeah, um, Briarwood is a, uh, a residential community in Okemos. It's been around for a very long time. Um, and we've had a garden for a very long time. Um, and just recently we've we've been become a part of the Greater Lansing Garden Project. And um, we've got some great support recently from the Meridian Township and from the Garden Project. Um, we've, and so this is a, a satellite image of our garden and the yellow box is where it exists today. We've expanded it by about 50%. And um, we also, you can kind of, yeah, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but you can see um, a little brown patch in the in the ground where uh, Meridian Township so nicely installed a water meter for us. And then we had a water line installed. So um, the garden's been there for a very long time without water, without fencing or with ad hoc fencing. And um, it's, been more or less just a Briarwood community garden. And um, since we've joined the garden um, project, um, it's been expanded to allow others from all over the township. And we do have um, about 50% of our members are from outside of Briarwood. And um, we're very happy to have that. Um, and over the last couple of years, we've had some some big improvements such as the the water line um, that made a huge improvement and it increased its interest in the garden um, quite a bit. And um, we also now have a, we expanded the garden because we, we were filled up and um, we had a waiting list. And so we expanded it this year and we now have another waiting list um, for the bigger garden. I think we have around 30 gardeners. Um, Jean probably has more num better numbers than I do. Roughly around 30 gardens gardeners um, using it. And um, we um, have a very diverse group of folks um, and it, it's a lot of fun. Um, and we do have a fence up now. Um, we worked out a, a unique deal with um, to get a grant for supplies from Home Depot. And um, the Briarwood um, 
homeowners association paid for the labor to install the fence and so now we have a permanent fence and we don't have skunks or groundhogs or deer in our garden anymore and that's made a huge difference it was uh, qu quite a relief to have that a nice solid garden this year um, and also we've gotten um, since the fence has been up um, and more people are there at the garden um, I've been truly surprised and impressed pleased to hear see people stop by and just stop and say hey this place looks beautiful and they're not even they don't even live in the area they're just visiting a friend and they felt like it was important to let us know how much they they liked the garden being there and and seeing it um another neat thing about becoming a part of the garden project is um we got access to a group of I I get on every Wednesday. volunteers from uh, Deloitte, uh, the consulting firm, and about 25 of their staff came out this spring to help us with uh, garden preparation. They installed paths for us with um, you know, the help of Julie and her, and, um, her group. Um, they helped with fencing and they helped with planting. It was a it's really a nice day to have all those folks out there and get that um, that free time, that free help. Um, and it, like I said, we're, we have wait list again um, with our expanded garden, and um, we're just very pleased at how well it's going and um, how diverse of a group it is. Um, as um, the other woman mentioned, um, we have folks from all over the all over the globe, really. Or, um, working there and it's been really interesting for all of us to uh, to to do and and it's um it's a great thing for us and i'd like to hand it over to jean for her thoughts on this on this project i don't know <clears throat> julie if you wanted to say anything in between should i just go ahead okay Okay, thanks, Mark. <laughs> okay, um, well, I am one of the co-garden leaders along with Mark and his wife, Michelle. Um, and I, I've been gardening there probably since around 2005. So carrying my own water to the garden for many years. <laughs> and uh, we had a hard time keeping the garden plots full, you know, because of how much effort was involved. We often had empty plots with weeds and you know, we were conscious of the neighboring homes. We didn't get too many complaints, but a few. <laughs> um, but, uh, and yeah, so as how long the garden's been there, it's been there at least 40 years. No, I, I, I talked with some early residents in the neighborhood and no one really knows when it started. Yeah. Last year, we did have a woman drive by. Um, I think you were there too, Mark, and she, and Michelle was there, and she got out of her car and thanked us. She was happy to see the garden was still up and running because her father had been the garden leader for many years, and it was a name I did not even recognize. <laughs> so a little bit of history of the garden. Um, but yeah, but it's, it's great. We've had great support from the garden project and the township, both financially and just in, um, you know, the other type of support that goes along with being affiliated with with the project in putting in the water line. Leroy Harvey, thank you. Leroy, for, I didn't need to say your last name. Thank you, though, for helping guide that through and um, all of your constant support through that and for letting us know about the Home Depot grant. Um, we did fundraising last year um, selling produce from the garden you know, in an effort to, you know, use that Twitter fence. And we did well. I mean, we saved, we, we raised $500, which is pretty good. And then we got the fence quote and realized that we were never going to make that <laughs> with with our fundraising. So, um, yes, we were able to apply for that grant and um, and received the grant for, for materials. And Michelle and Mark um, really saw that fence oversaw the fence installation. They were great. Our son was getting married, so I wasn't very available. But we do have we had our first annual potluck this year, which was great. It brought everyone together at the end of the season when we don't see people as much because you know a lot of the harvesting is planting is done and the harvesting is done. You know, we really we have a really great community at the garden. That's one of the things I love about it. Um, every year I learn something new and say, okay, next year I'm gonna do it this way. <laughs> um, but 
so those are those are the things that uh, that you know I love about the gardening. Um, as Mark mentioned, we have a really diverse group of gardeners. I've had to use Google Translate a few times, um, or other gardeners help translate, which is which is great. And um, yeah, it was just the with the fence and the water supply. Now it's like we have a real garden. We could not have done it without the garden project's help. Um, you know, I, I mentioned the township as well. So um, I don't have too much more to add on. I know last last summer, one father who was on paternity leave was walking through the garden with his little boy. They weren't gardeners on their way to the park and said that they walk through the garden every every day and their little boy calls it Elmo's Garden. I thought it was very sweet. So it's, it's really impacting the greater community outside of just the gardeners who garden there. Um, if you haven't watched my time, I might might be at the end of my five minutes. I'm just trying to. Yeah, I guess that that's really it. Um, yeah, we didn't use to fence in. It happened organically. It was haphazard. You know, we put our own fences up because of the deer. And Michelle and Mark joined the garden and said, "Why is everyone fencing in their own garden plot? Why don't we fence in the whole thing?" <laughs> so it was great to have that new perspective. I said, "Yeah, you're right." <laughs> um, so they've they've been great. Um, yeah, so there are three of us co-garden leaders, and um, yeah, we've got a nice, nice feel there. Um, all right, I'll I'll sign it back over. <laughs> Thank you. I just put in a a very quick plug uh, for working with the garden project. Um, with with almost ten community gardens or more, um, it's really nice to have a group that has with experience in garden leadership, um, as well as a system in place to, to provide expertise and support, um, a grant program, and it's just made um, made it really easy to partner. And just to see the growth in the gardens has been very impressive. I've had very little to do with it other than making a phone call or two. But um, thank you, Julie, um, for all the work that the Garden Project has done to help facilitate this. And I want to hand it back to you. We also have another um, person here. I think she's still here. Um, Barb Sears. Maybe she she had to leave. Oh, there she is. Um, who manages gardens around the township as well. So I, I'm hoping she'll have a chance to say a couple words. And maybe we'll have a special dialogue about the Meridian Garden Club as well in the future. But go ahead, Julie. Well, I can share a bit about... Um garden project in general, but I do want to open it up in case um, Jean and Esther and Mark do need to sign off again. I want to highlight that they are, thank you for your kind words, Leroy, but also this is, I feel very honored to have a paid position with Greater Lansing Food Bank just to support community gardens. It's, um, I do not take that for granted every day. I think what a special opportunity I have um, and want to put that back that we, there is no way, even with our paid small but mighty team, um, the gardens in, in our greater Lansing area would have this type of impact without on-site volunteer garden leaders who are the heart and soul of those gardens, who are the ones truly there knowing the community, growing food, aware of what, um, how to um, create special spaces within their own community and who are doing this. I mean, time feels precious, even, you know, as <laughs> every year it feels more and more precious. So to give that time so generously um, to, to build up within their own community, I just want to, I can't overstate the impact of that. Um, of, I think when you go about into those gardens, you really feel that. So we very much learn on how to do our work, hopefully well, um, from the community. It is, I do not have a degree in community gardening. I did not, you know, I did not take my four year degree in that. That is not a course that is offered. You, I truly have learned it from the very generous time offerings of community members doing this work. So a lot of times it is um, when I get asked a question, I'm just referring back to garden leaders who have done that. Mark just generously gave me an amazing write up on how did you actually go through and work with those contractors to get that fence and what was the cost? And then, so any, oftentimes if we're looking good as a, a organization, it is just a direct reflection of community members who are in the field doing that work um, amongst neighbors. So um, I'll speak a little bit generally about Garden Project, but I would love to hear from Barb because again, 
um, garden projects just involved with a handful of gardens um, that are pretty food focused and always always looking for more involvement. But I'm, I again, I love learning from community, so I'll hand it over to Barb. Gosh, I this was lovely to hear about. I'm very excited, and I've got a, a bunch of questions, if I may. Um, I'm wondering if these garden areas have if they have compost sites within the garden. I could imagine that'd be very handy for your gardeners. We do not. We're actually considering that. We've had, talked about it a little bit. Um, I know one garden, um, Gabby Meyer, has a uh, is involved with a garden near a uh, church. I can't remember what the specific one. And I wanted to go look at their system. I think they have one set up, but we don't yet. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested to hear about people who do have <laughs> that. Um, this is Esther um, at uh, Wardcliffe. We have a compost site. And uh, fortunately, not only Marty, but we have a couple of people who work in landscaping that have so much knowledge and they're so generous in sharing. They created a wired kind of um thing with uh, um, some wooden structures and we dump all our grass and weeds and things into that compost. Um, and last year we got some lettuce out of it. <laughs> uh, somehow, you know, lettuce was growing around the compost. <laughs> Yeah, that's often uh, tomatoes will often grow out of compost and be you can transplant them. And but um, yeah, really handy to be able to have. The problem is it will attract some critters, some that can pl climb over your deer fence perhaps. But um, but they're gonna they might focus on if there's vegetable waste in the compost. I figure that's a type of recycling too. So we have it outside of the fence under ah. a pine tree. So it's, you have to carry your, you know, weeds and stuff into that compost. Mm -hmm. Julie, are there gardens in the, um, in the hundred that you help manage that um, have really nice compost systems that you would recommend us learning from? Um, most of the gardens that I know of are taking compost offsite. It's a tricky situation. Oftentimes, I mean, we're lucky in this area that land is more available than some other um, other communities, coastal communities, other states, um, but oftentimes in the garden we see space, the high priority space being used for growing. And then um, it's a, a little of this is happening in the chat, but we're speaking of Hammond Farms, which does an excellent job locally that is able to um, compost at a really high efficient rate using windrows and their heavy equipment. Um, Probably at the home garden scale, pretty accessible to turn a compost pile with a digging fork um, and a body. At a farm scale, pretty great to um, send a tractor through. We do have a couple sites um, where a tractor can go through with the bucket and simply turn it. Have it, it, it that in between where it's large enough that you would need um, either a team of 20 teenagers really going at it for a while or um, or a bucket, but you just don't have the space constraints, then it can be tricky. So we're really fortunate to have, we take a lot of waste to Hammond Farms who then we also purchase and donates back. So are still um, keeping that in cycle as well. So maybe if others can speak to that, please feel free. I think I interrupted Barb, go ahead. No, no, I'm, I, well, I, I just say that um, whether you do, a really structured composting or you just have a green waste area that eventually is going to deteriorate and give you soil back. I mean, either are valuable ways to um, to deal with, with waste. Um, and so it's great that you have the cooperation with Hammond Farms. I had a couple of, I had a couple of specific questions I'm in, curious about, about the um, Briarwood. And we might want to go back to the map. I, I was wondering, um, who the land belongs to. And it looked like on your map that there were to the north, there were some other very large plots that they kind of had a similar appearance to what's in your your small plot farms or those larger gardens that individuals have. 
or if there was north there's looks like there's a little trail to the north maybe through that mm -hmm. area yeah there is a trail um and it's partially paved and um, people use that for uh, walking through there all, all day long um but the the plots um or the, the plots that you can see, let me see if I can share my screen yet again. Um, here we go. Um, share. Um, these two though, the, uh, so there, here's the Meridian Township, big, huge water tower. Yeah. And so this up is north. Um, these are actually old plots. They're kind of paved and uh, very old. Um, leftover construction things and all of this land as far as i know is either under the high power right away or is owned by the briarwood community um and the garden definitely is um so um this is this is only gardening that we we know of in this area um, um these other plots um to the west are um, paved over old old stuff, and huh. I don't I don't know the history of those. Those those were actually, believe it or not, shuffleboard courts at one time. Yeah, uh, so cool. um, they are now just slabs of cement. <laughs> That's right. Uh, yeah. Don't let the pickleball community find out about them; <laughs> they'll get taken <laughs> over. <laughs> I already sent out an email to them. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, this is Briarwood, correct? Yeah. Um, I'm in Tacoma Hills, and we had been investigating, uh, I guess, dues in different neighborhoods. And we found that Briarwood's records are online somewhere, and that there's many thousands of dollars in the treasury in Briarwood neighborhood. And wondered if you were able to tap into any of the neighborhood funds to use toward the garden. So I'm also on the HOA board. Ah, <laughs> <So okay. laughs> I won't get too involved, but Mark, you, you please, you're welcome. You, you know about what this as well. They did actually um, set aside funds to support the water supply. Um, and they did contribute to the labor costs to install the fence. Um, yeah, actually, the goal is to replace a playground structure that had to be removed because it was no longer deemed to be safe, and that's a really expensive capital funds project. So that's where some of that money is earmarked for, if that's helpful to know. But that's another issue, another point. So, I'll, yeah. Thanks. Uh, Julie, um, years ago, um, the food bank had a uh, an incubator farm south of the township off Hagedorn Road, by right behind Sir Happy Hollow. And uh, at that point in time, they started up a CSA for a couple of years, which I took part in. Um, is that still in operation? I know they they uh, stopped doing the CSA, but um, it was, it was kind of a unique spot. There were a lot of immigrant families that were doing their own little plots there. And uh, I loved the CSA because I would get things in my weekly uh, um, gift bag that uh, I had to look up online to say, what the hell is this? And how am I going to eat it? Uh, it? But it was great. I loved it. Thanks for your question, Bruce. Um, CSA, for those of you, you who don't know, are, is called a, it stands for Community Supported Agriculture, where it's almost in the same model of a magazine subscription. You pay up front for a, a, a season long subscription of vegetables that then come to you um, each week or biweekly, um, which is a great model. There are still some great CSAs in the area, Ten Hen Farms, um, Allen Neighborhood Center, um, Titus Farms, some great CSAs just to check into. The Lansing Roots Farm, which again, Bruce was um, on Hagedorn and Harper and Mason um, sitting under Happy Hollow Kiwanis Club property is no longer um, an incubator farm that was part of a USDA grant and that ended and um, 
however, um, Garden Project was able to maintain um, the lease on that land and it is now a community garden and the largest in our network. It's a eight acre community garden um, plots that are, um, gosh, like a 30 by 60 size and about 100 families and still uh, retains that um, a new American focus. So mostly um, gardeners from um, Southeast Asia and West Africa. So, um, but they are growing for themselves and their families as in a community garden model. Um, the cool thing about that property, again, it's a Kiwanis Club property, is it, we're just part, we're, we're one um, leaseholder there and there is free camping, there's a pond, there's a, a hiking area and back. So if you're ever on your way out to Mason and you want a little to, to pop in, you can just pull right into Dur Happy Hollow Kiwanis Club property and um, camp out there or take a little hike. So it's a, a pretty special property. So yeah, They had uh, at least one hoop house uh, out there. Are those still there? There are still, there are two now, and those are still being utilized. Um, one of the farmers that was part of that incubator farm program still farms there um, and holds a lease with Kiwanis Club. That farm is called Hot Pepper Karani Farm. You can find them on Facebook. He's um, an excellent local grower. Um, and a, another farmer who was part of the program is now part of the garden and utilizing that space. So we're happy to see that still being utilized. That's a a great commodity. Again, a, a hoop house is a, kind of an unheated greenhouse that will extend your season so that you have a, a warmer, uh, your soil is warmer to grow in in those shoulder months of um, March, April, uh, November, December. Maybe uh, any other immediate questions for um, Briarwood or for um, Wardcliffe? Can you give the uh, elevator speech um, about starting, say somebody wants to start a community garden in their neighborhood. I, you mentioned the importance of the garden leaders, which we have a couple here. <clears throat> um, do you have, can you do, do that briefly? I'd be happy to, and I'll share a little bit more about our um, program as well, if now is an appropriate time. So um, I had mentioned, you know, Meridian Township is home to 10 of garden projects, 88 community gardens, and those encompass about just under 30 acres of collective food production that are happening in our service area. Um, just over 1 million pounds of food um, estimated grown. So that's a a, a significant when you think about the quality of that food and and both and also the variety of that food that is grown that's making an impact in um local diets it's pretty significant um so again lots of reasons for a community garden um we like to say if a community garden can be anything it's just a group of people growing together um as a program of greater lansing food bank though we do make food the focus so when it comes down to um, limited resources, we do try to make sure that those are going to gardens that are where people are growing food for themselves and their community, um, especially people who are from low to low moderate income families are growing for donation. Um, Meridian Township's funding has made it possible to just have really consistent support of resources going to local Meridian Township Gardens. So Esther had mentioned compost that comes, um, things like straw bales that will help with mulching. Um, some, some of the gardens in the network this year were able to build, swap out some new raised beds that are at senior living homes in Meridian Township that really help with accessibility. And then we're able to at least make a contribution towards some of the larger projects that happen at gardens, things like irrigation and fencing improvements um, that at least help for some of those larger projects. Um, if a garden would, a couple ways to become part of the network, both if, if you're already a, a, a gar an existing community garden, um, simply just being in touch. And then we have um, resources to pass along community garden resources, like some of the items I just mentioned, and gardener resources. We have tool lending libraries. We do free seeds and plant starts um, at our Garden Project Resource Center on the east side of Lansing. Um, so, so things that just can help the average home or community gardener 
um, reduce their cost to growing food over the season. And then if a group is interested in starting a new garden, we do offer leadership trainings um, yearly for community garden <laughs> groups. Um, so we do ask, you know, just a, a minimum of five households um, to be part of that startup group. And then um, we have some really great curriculums to kind of talk you through the process of visioning out a garden to begin with, what is the vision and the purpose of that garden. Um, we work from an asset-based community development model um, where we're saying, what, what assets does that neighborhood group have initially? And let's start from a strengths-based approach and then fill in the gaps um, as out, an outside uh, community member for, um, for fill, to, to start up that garden. So we always say start small and Oftentimes it's interesting, people are watching, you know, you might just say, I don't know why more people aren't involved. Well, oftentimes people are watching the garden and when they see some success, and I think Briarwood is um, a great example of that, when they see things flourishing, they say, oh, I would love to be involved. So, you know, just start small, have some success off the top. And then there, there's um, always, then you can recruit more help and more people in um, to, to grow out that vision. So that's very a, a general overview of some of our, our startup work. I'm sure there's more questions. I know Jean had one in the chat. Yeah, I, I was just wondering um, who we can, we have I think 13 people on our waiting list for next summer. And, um, and we'll be able to accommodate two of those. Um, but who can we refer them to? What's the best way to refer them to another garden if they, you know, can't, if we can't accommodate them next year? Should they, Julie, should we have them contact you or Leroy, should we have them contact you? They'd be welcome to contact us. Um, not always great at doing two things at once, but I will drop our, um, website into the chat, um, which is really a, a helpful website for you all. We do try to make note of, um, we map out the gardens that are um, in the, the area so that people can search by map. And they don't have to get involved with a garden that's just directly in their community. Um, oftentimes gardens will, will allow people outside, you know, the neighborhood to come join. You know, they might be, another family member there, so they're there, or it's on their way home from work. Um, so they could search by map, and then on, when they zero into that particular website they wanna know more about, we do our best to try to have updated contact information on there, but they'd always just be welcome to call our garden project office and we could talk them through. Um, of course, location is always a kind of where we start to help people decide, but there oftentimes are other considerations too. We'd be able, we don't have it listed on the website, but we could talk to them about accessibility of water, of um, if they need raised bed space, if they need you know easier parking. So we could really try to be specific. Um, and for every garden that might have a wait list, there might be two others that are that are looking for for gardeners. Um, we really try to see gardens full before maybe a new garden would start in that area too. So. That's a general way to address that, but yes, they'd be welcome to reach out to us and talk that through. Thank you. They just want to get some exercise. Have them call Barb Sears. <laughs> I've got a question. Um, yeah, the Meridian Garden Club, we're, we're kind of stretched thin. We're mostly old retired ladies and we're trying to take care of a lot of public gardens. But um, my, my question is uh, when you... Um, it seems like the hardest part of getting something started is getting the ground tilled and worked that very first year. Um, do you are do you have equipment? Is that up to individual? If you say a garden's expanding or you've got a new garden getting started, is there a source for equipment? Or is that up to people? Do they have bring shovels and spades and do it on their own. What what? How do you get things started? Well, um, my garden teacher told me, and I always have it in the back of my mind, like in general, everything is specific. <laughs> so I'll start with that. But um, that would be a good example of where we do try to take that asset-based approach because every group is different. For every group that might be like 
downtown Meridian Township that says like the hardest part of starting a garden is finding a tractor or tiller. There might be a garden in Stockbridge who says like the easiest part is finding a tractor. I just call my neighbor and they come over and do it. So um, we do try to get a sense of, you know, what is the sticking point and then jump in. So um, sometimes with a group like that, if I, I want to speak, I'm going to give a general answer, but then I'll give a real specific one. So as an example of what to do when there might be like, I just, we just don't know how to handle this as a group. It would, we often say, have you put it out to your full network? Have you put it out to anyone involved to just say, does anyone have access to a tractor where we might be able to hire you out for a day and we've got flexibility in this way? We could pay you in cookies. We could pay you in cash. You know, what would work? It's always worth that first ask because you never know where there might be a connection point. And not only does it get the job done, but it draws another person into the cause. Um, so it's getting your group little by little expanded where another person might be aware of your project. So that's a general answer, just something to consider. If you've taken that course and there, you put it out there, there's no one. We're really fortunate with, um, Bruce had mentioned the incubator farm. We did inherit that tractor when um, that program closed. So Garden Project is fortunate to have a tractor and we also do contract, we contract out as well because we don't have enough capacity with um, one tractor. So we try to keep track. I just often search on Craigslist at the beginning of each season um, because there are often people that will um, contract till and they'll come in and, and put their tractor on a tiller. So I we use that as a service each year as well. So um, I'd be happy to pass along some names to you or to put on a list um, if we're able to, to add that into our work plan, we, we would try to do that too, so. Can I add, uh, this is Esther from uh, Wardcliffe. I think Julie's point of getting people uh, involved so that they take ownership, new people. Fortunately, even if they were a bit difficult about, about water and you know our liability insurance and all that, we are on Okama's, um school grounds. And we know very well that Wardcliffe School will be torn down at some point. And we are very aware of developers wanting to buy the land and all of that. And one of the wonderful things that happened with the garden flourishing is at the board meeting, people came up to me and said, oh, our garden, Esther, is doing very well. You want it to be their garden so they won't destroy it. And I think that looking at sustainability over time is really important. And people won't destroy something that they feel part of. So we make sure that the tilling is done by Okama schools. It's like routine now, like the sun rises in the morning, if it's spring, they'll come and rototill the whole garden and very well. And we make sure they are thanked and that they're included. So I think expanding your ownership beyond the gardeners is a good idea. And I know that all our neighbors, you know, we're always nervous uh, about what they're going to do with that land and um at zoning boards or whatever, our neighborhood turns out. <laughs> and we, we're we concerned about, you know, the Costco traffic on um, Park Lake Road. Um, but it's one of the beautiful green space for soccer teams right now. And the garden is, they tell me, we know about the garden. I said, oh, very good. <laughs> so I think that's one thing to consider. Can't help but note that uh, Peter, another avid gardener and the former curator of the Beale Garden, is is here, and he'll be presenting next month or in January about um, apples. And um, hope you'll join that. And then Valerie is also on the call. She'll she'll be talking next week about food rescue and some of the food initiatives that she's been in, stewarding along. So, and I hope we'll um, the Meridian Garden Clubs will. We'll do a special presentation at one of these dialogues as well, Barb. But what other questions do we have for Julie or our garden leaders? Oh, Sam, sorry. Uh, thanks, thanks, Leroy. 
Actually, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to uh, just kind of chime in about what an important um, feature this is for the community. Actually, the all of all the um, gardening plots that you have around the community is is tremendous. And um, I got to share a little bit of a trivia thing, maybe a tidbit here about. Um, the roots that the Meridian Township has that isn't just, you know, gardens in Meridian Township, but people that I know, some of my really close friends, um, Leroy, maybe you've heard the name Beth Hagenboo, who um, is one of the collaborators on the little book that I'm putting together about Mud Lake, but um, she's a landscape architect and um, has done some really great community gardening work in Detroit. And um, I'm gonna tr take the liberty here of uh, just sharing this instead of, maybe I can put it in the chat too, but Lafayette Greens, she she and her husband, Ken Weichel, were designers of this garden in downtown Detroit, which um, as this, you can see here is voted the best in Detroit. Um, and it, it, but what they've done here too is combined art into the garden in a really special way. Uh, and by when you talk about ownership, you, you know this is a this is something in downtown Detroit that people just have taken ownership of. And events, you know, weddings happen here. Um, it's really a spectacular community amenity. I guess that's where I'm trying to go with this: is how these uh, community gardens can really take off not just you know for growing food but really holding a community together a big community like Detroit so um and I the biggest thing I want to mention is you know emphasizes how um this is a person that grew up on the edge of my lake you know and this is how uh, these things go where Marine Township isn't just Marine Township it's it it has roots all over Michigan and probably beyond that we don't even know about about all the great things that are nurtured here in uh, in Meridian. So just something to share and uh, kind of an interesting thing to me. Thank you, and hopefully we'll have a dialogue about your Mud Lake project um, in the in the coming year as well, which is off to print soon, I hear. Yeah, if we can get through the edits, and we're still um, every time I look at it, I find blunders that you know don't make sense. So, uh, but we're it with any luck, it's going to come out in January. How about anyone else who hasn't had a chance to speak? Uh, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, or raise your hand um, and just any questions or observations you want to share. We've got about ten more minutes. Uh, I just wanted to mention that in the chat, there's some talk about uh, clay soils and um, going back to that uh, incubator farm on Hagedorn, uh, one of the ways that they did it, which was a, a kind of a no-till um, method is uh, they planted some kind of a, um, a turnip that had a long straight root system and they did it uh, late in the year because it would grow um, a pretty significant root uh, later in the year and then they just left it there and this served to aerate the soil and also provide organic matter and that's one of the ways that they were doing which was a pretty low labor um, method of improving that very clay soil it's kind of cool I think it was um, daikon radish. Not that you couldn't, I mean, turnip would do the same thing, but they're, they've bred even some daikon radish that to be especially like clay busting. And then the cool thing is when they're decomposing as well, they're kind of adding more um, organic matter humus to the soil as well. So we grew some big daikon radish out there. Um, so that's a really cool thing. In the chat, I'll put an opportunity. We do an e-newsletter. This time of year, we're pretty quiet, but um, come gardening season, we're pretty much weekly. 
for ways to get involved. And then we have, we have a Facebook page, so I can drop those in the chat. Um, I loved what Sam just said about those ripple effects. I think about that sometimes, about just that impact of you know an interaction or the impact of of a, of a garden and i think it's just really i love letting my brain kind of trail out about those ripple effects of of, of what a community garden could be so um i'd be remiss not to just mention our greater uh lansing food bank you know garden project is a component of a, of, of our entire region's food bank and so we are working on um, food distribution, everything from about 140 agencies that are receiving food from the food bank, doing mobile distributions. I encourage people to also follow our food bank's um, Facebook page and just repost every, uh, we try to make sure that we have regular um, updates on what your local mobile food distribution is. We're just really trying to destigmatize, you know, there there is food available. There's no reason anyone should be hungry. If we have food in this community. We have food across this world. It's just a matter of um, distribution to it. Um, there's it's not unusual that there might be a time in life that we could all use a hand and that's what a community is for. So um, you can follow that and see ways to share out. We, we do senior boxes, we do backpacks for kids. Um, so a lot of different, we're doing DoorDash now. We have a great partnership with them for people who are, are not, who are homebound. We're just really trying to think in, innovatively about um, how to get food to people people in need. And then when Garden Project, um, when our season starts unrolling, a great place to find us is at our Garden Project Resource Center, where we do seed and plant distribution. We have a tool lending library, great free workshops um, that we offer. We're, we're finalizing our schedule for 2024, but we'll have those posted online. Um, and so that's a great way to get involved, whether you um, have an income need or not, you know, just come be part of the gardening community at, at one of the workshops and looking for, always looking for volunteers. So that's fun, whether it's a one-off at a community garden, like Mark and Jean had mentioned, we um, were lucky to host groups and send those out to gardens across the network or to be part of our resource center. We do um, two to three times a week, a community distribution of seeds and plants. And you don't have to be a gardener to be part of that resource center distribution to volunteer there, but it's always great because it's a great chance for that informal um, gardening conversations to take place. And because anyone is welcome there, you really are reducing the stigma of, you know, you can just come as a gardener, come participate as somebody who loves to grow good food and um, leave with a couple new plants and get a chance to talk with fellow community members. So would love to have you involved, you know, um, give a couple plugs there. So I have a question about the seeds. Um, so when I try to do my small little garden at home, I buy a thing of seeds and then I have way too many, but then they don't last the next year because of the way th that they have created seeds to be. So is it the kind of thing that you can come and get a certain like number of seeds or how does, how does seed distribution work? Yeah, this time of year, speaking of volunteer opportunities, we're doing a ton of seed sorting at our distribution centers. We're very fortunate to get seed donated to us. And most seeds actually are viable um, in a, a couple years out. You, we, we toss onions and we toss leeks. Those are generally not so good after um, a year or two. Um, but beyond that, um, if you do a simple Google search of seed viability, vegetable seeds, you'll get a list of, um, you know, generally speaking, two, three, four years are okay. And then if that seed germinates, um, it's not so much that it would not grow a, a large productive plants. It would just be that fewer of those seeds may germinate. So if you have a, a seed packet that's a couple years old, what we encourage people to do is just sow a little bit heavier to give yourselves a higher percentage chance of those seeds germinating. It. But then once they do, um, it would just, it, it, you'll be in good shape. So I just um, sidetracked myself from your question, which was how many seed packets? Um, sorry. So when you come to the Garden Project Resource Center, generally we do uh, 25 seed packets per gardener per season, which is a lot of food um, generally that you, you'd grow more than you'd need for, um, you know, a, a, a probably a family of four, um, mostly vegetable, but we do have some flower and herb available too. And we're lucky we've um, 
we've already brought in more seed packets than, than I think we have any year. So we'll be flush with seeds and we give those out other ways as well. We do garden to go bags that we send out to pantries, um, to agencies across the seven counties we serve. So if people can't make it to our garden project resource center, we can get it that way. And then um, small seed racks that we send out to agencies as well. But if say you are part of a garden club or um, part of a school garden or just need seeds for an event that you're doing or a club you're involved with, please get a hold of us, especially if you have flexibility in what you might need. Um, we'd be happy to send them along. Uh, we're trying to just steward that for the community. We want to get those seeds out though. They're not, so definitely start with us um, if you could use those. Thank you. Sure. I want to mention very briefly, some of you have been involved with the Green Grants Initiative, but uh, the Green Grants from Meridian are expanding next year. Um, John is on our Green Grant Committee. Uh, if you're thinking about another type of garden that's not a food garden or some signage or a rain garden <clears throat> or another sort of environmentally friendly project of some sort, uh, please give one of us a, <clears throat> a ring and we'll hopefully be promoting that um, a little bit later this year, but to do some cool initiatives in the township. So don't necessarily have to be a community garden, but community gardens would be eligible for green grants as well. <clears throat> so just throwing it out there. Any other questions for our garden leaders or Julie or comments before we sign off here? Thank you everyone for tuning in for a juicy hour of information. And um, uh, hopefully we'll see you next week um, when Valerie talks a little bit about food rescue and some of the other food and composting initiatives in the township. So um, thank you, Esther. Thank you, Jean, Mark, um, and everybody for your great questions. And Barb, uh, let's schedule a, a time for the Meridian Gardens Club as well. Hope to see you next week. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Always appreciate the opportunity to connect with you all. Thank you, Leroy. Thank you, Julie. That was great. And your uh, networking with other garden leaders was just fantastic. Wonderful. Take care.